All right, number one, Bob and Susan. Bob is one of eight boys. Susan is one of 18 girls. The probability that Bob and Susan are selected is going to be 1 8th times 1 18th. We're looking at two events happening in succession. So uh, we will multiply those probabilities. And we come up with 1 over 144. Number two is an independence dependence question. Um, picture, you know, if, you, if you've played baseball or softball or, or are familiar with them, if you're about to go up to the plate um, and have a plate appearance and have an at bat, if you turn to your neighbor before you walk up and say, hey, I caught a fly ball last inning, so that increases the likelihood that I'm going to get a hit, um, they're going to say, well, no, I don't think it does. Um, catching a fly ball has no effect on, on hitting a, a baseball. Uh, so the probability of getting a hit is equal to the probability of getting a hit given that you've previously caught a fly ball. Uh, some may, might argue that catching a fly ball you know, says something about maybe your athletic ability and increases your likelihood for getting a hit. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and say these two things are, uh, are independent events because the probability of getting a hit is equal to the probability of getting a hit given that you've caught a fly ball. Uh, now we go to B. We have drawing a club. Uh, and then drawing a second card without replacing it, and that is is getting a spade. So, A, I'm going to call the club. B, I'm going to say that's our spade. Uh, part B here is without replacement. So let's look at the probability of drawing a spade, because um, that's our, our second draw. And then let's look at the probability of drawing a spade, given that the first draw actually occurred. So just on its own, the probability of, of drawing a spade, well, there are 13 spades out of the 52 cards. So 13 out of 52. The probability of drawing a spade, given that you've already drawn a club, well, drawing that club here, Hey, Jason. Drawing that club here, if that's already happened, one club has been drawn, that means there are only 51 cards left. There are still 13 spades, but one club has been drawn. So if you look at the comparison here, these two probabilities are not equal. If we compare 1350 seconds and 1351st, they're not equal. So we're going to go ahead and classify these events as dependent events because the probability of drawing a spade is uh, is increased if you have uh, already drawn a club and not replaced it. Okay, in problem uh, 2C, this is rolling a pair of dice once and getting an odd number on one die, and getting a sum of 8. So let's look at uh, the experiment. Rolling a pair of dice once. Event A, uh, let's say, is the odd number on one die. And let's say only one. Only one odd die. And event B is the two dice, uh, they have a sum of it was 8. Okay. So if we simply look at P of A, and P of A given B, we can make our, 
our final answer, our final conclusion. So P of A, the odd number on one die and one die only. So if I look over here at my grid, One, two, three, four, five, six. I'll have 36 squares, 36 possibilities. And I roll these two die. And we want to look at, of those 36, how many are an odd number on one die. So I'll just highlight them real quick. So one and only one. So not one, one. That won't count. But you go one, two, one, four, one, six, two, one, two, three, two, five, three, two, three, four, three, six. 4, 1, 4, 3, 4, 5, 5, 2, 5, 4, 5, 6, and 6, 1, 6, 3, 6, 5. So if you look at all of the spots that I've highlighted out of the 36, you're going to have, I believe, 18 of them. So out of the 36 possibilities, 18 of them result in an odd on one die. And yes, we could reduce that fraction. Now let's look at P of A given B. Well, condition B says, hey, guess what? We're looking at a sum of 8. So I go back to my board over here and it says, okay, uh, it's like somebody's peeking at the dice and saying, hey, uh, the sum on the two dice is 8. So let's look at all of the areas where the sum of the two dice is 8. So we could go, let's see, 2 and 6. We could go 6 and 2. Um, I'm going to do it this way. 2 and 6. 6 and 2. 5 and 3. 3 and 5. And 4 and 4. So given that we have a sum of 8, what's the probability that an odd number on one die and only one die? Well... If you look at the places where I've put x's in here, on those possible sums of 8, uh, are any of them marked from the original, like where we put the yellow circles? No. No. So the probability of getting an odd number on only one die when the sum is 8 is 0. So we're looking at dependent events. The question might have been more interesting if we would have said, you know, event A was an odd number on at least one die. Um, so if you want to rework that problem, feel free to do so. It might be good practice. Uh, all right, D. Landing on a four on a spinner and flipping tails on a coin. So events A and B. Uh, four on spinner tails on coin P of A versus P of A given B so do you think that they will be the same? do you think that they will be different? and my argument is that they're going to be the same because the fact that I've just flipped a coin and it's come up tails is not going to increase, decrease, or it's not going to change the probability that I uh, spin the spinner and I get a 4. We don't know how many colors are on that spinner, or, or how many numbers, I should say. So we don't know what the probability of A is. But we do know that um, if we have just flipped a coin and it came up tails, that's not going to change the probability that uh, we spin that spinner and get a 4. So I'm going to say independent. And we can safely say that uh, flipping the coin and having it turn up hail, tails does not affect 
the probability of spinning the spinner and having it land on four. Okay, next question. Uh, question three. Six blue and ten red. I'll find the probability of picking three red buttons if each button is not returned to the bag before the next button is picked. So draw red and draw red and draw red, but don't ever put them back. So in the beginning you have 16 buttons. The probability of drawing a red is 10 out of 16. This is your first draw. The second draw, well there are 9 red left and only 15 markers left. And the third draw, there are now 8 red left and 14 markers. As we move down the line here, we're taking a red marker out every time. So, you know, the total is going to decrease by one, and the total number of red is going to decrease by one as well. So, if we multiply this all out, uh, 10 times 9 times 8 divided by 16 times 15 times 14, well, we could we could reduce here and, and save ourselves some work. So let's let's do that. We want to deal with some smaller numbers. All right, so 10 sixteenths is going to be 5 eighths. Uh, 9 fifteenths is going to be 3 fifths. 8 fourteenths is going to be 4 sevenths. So if you think about multiplying these all out, you'll have 5 times 3 times 4 over 8. 8 times 5 times 7. And some of you may notice that the 5's are going to cancel. So you have 3 times 4 up top. But you could also say, well, I have a 4 up top and an 8 down below. So if I cross out the 4 and the 8, the 4 will become a 1 and the 8 will become a 2. So we have 3 in the numerator and 14 in the, in the denominator. So the probability of that happening is 3 fourteenths. 4 three discs and a CD player. We have disc one, uh, disc two, and disc three. Uh, on disc one has, has six songs, disc two, fourteen, and three, ten. So six, fourteen, and ten. So we have a total of 30 songs. Alright, we're going to randomly play. What is the probability that the first song is from disc 2 and the second is from disc 1? So, once that song from disc 2 plays, there's the light, that song will not show up again before the song from disc 1 does. So it's like uh, drawing cards and not replacing them. So look at the first thing that needs to happen. The probability that the first song is from disc 2. Well, 14 out of the 30 songs are from disc 2. Now after that song is played, there are only 29 songs left to play. And of those 29 songs, uh, we want the second song to be from disc 1. Well, none of those 6 songs have been played. So 6 out of the remaining, 29. Uh, we can multiply this out. Uh, let's reduce here. Uh, we can say, well, 2 goes into 6 3 times, 2 goes into 30 15 times, so that will help. Uh, oh, we could have gone even further. So 3 and 15 can cancel. 3 goes into 3 once, 3 goes into 15 5 times. Uh, 14 and 29, we can't do anything there. So we're going to end up with 14 times 1 divided by 5 times 29 which is 14 divided by uh, I think that should be 145 and that's your answer uh, 
question five. We're looking at the probability of drawing four diamonds in a row if we replace it after each draw. So probability of diamond and diamond and diamond and diamond. So those four things happening in a row. So we've got four probabilities to multiply. Thirteen diamonds on your first draw out of the total 52. We go ahead and put that back in. So there are still 13 out of the 52 cards are diamonds. And we go down the line, multiply these four times. So 13 to the fourth divided by 52 to the fourth. But 13 out of 52 is going to reduce. I think that reduces to 1 fourth. So we have 1 fourth, so 1 to the fourth, and 4 to the fourth which is 1 divided by 256. Problem 6, the probability of drawing 4 diamonds in a row if you do not replace the card after each draw. So I'm going to cheat here and copy and paste this stuff. See, I don't need this section. All right, so we should be okay with the first one here. But after we draw that diamond, there aren't 13 of them left. There are only 12, and there aren't 52 cards left. There are 51. So after you draw the second diamond, you should have 50 cards left and only 11 diamonds, because you've drawn two of the 13. And you can probably guess for the last probability, we're going to use 10 out of 49. So we have 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 out of 52 times 51 times 50 times 49. We could reduce here. Um, we we could say uh, we could look at let's say ten and fifty. Ten divided by fifty is one fifth. Um, anything else we could do there? We could do a little more. We could go with the twelve and the fifty-two and pair those up. But I'm gonna just gonna multiply across the top. I'll go the thirteen times twelve times eleven times one. And I get 17, 16. And in the bottom, I'll go 52, 51, 49, and 5. And I get 649,740. So if I divide those two and reduce it, I end up with 11 over 4,165. And as a decimal, point zero zero two six four one. So we're looking at about 0.26%. OK, problem 7. This looks like another problem where we have events happening in succession. Um, Andy's going to get uh, two hits in his next two at-bats. So a hit and then a hit. Well, 0.27 is the probability that he gets a hit. If it helps, you can think about that as 27 over 100. So he gets a hit and, so I'll multiply. He gets a hit, so I'll multiply again. So you got to ask yourself, are these events happening in succession, one after the other? And yes, they are. 
So we're gonna we're gonna multiply their probabilities together. So 0.27 times 0.27 will give us 0 0.0729 or 7.29% of the time Andy will get two hits in a row. Uh, eight. Find the probability of Andy not getting hit in his next at bat and then getting hits uh, at the two at bats after that. So P of not getting a hit. Well, that's got to be the opposite of him getting a hit. So this is the idea of how we calculate a complement. So 100% of the time something happens, and 27% of the time he gets a hit. So if we go 1 minus 0.27, we will get 0 0.83, 0 0.73. So the probability of Andy not getting a hit is 0.73. Now we have some things that are going to happen in succession. So he's not going to get a hit, and then he's going to get two hits in his at-bats after that. So this is probability of not a hit, uh, and a hit, and a hit. So we have our 0.73 times our 0.27 times our 0.27. And we've already done the work for 0.27 times 0.27. It was 0 0.0729. So we can multiply that out. And we get 0 0.053217. Or 5.3%. So 5.3% of the time, if Andy has three at-bats, he's going to not get a hit, get a hit, and then get a hit. Okay, that moves us to question 9. Alright, number 9. Uh, three different things that you're looking for. Um, as far as when you're playing the game, you want to get one of these three things. So, we know the probability of getting a paddle. This point is 37%, percent point three seven. The probability of getting a life jacket is 0.14. And the probability of getting sunscreen is 0 0.08. So what is the probability that you would not get any of those on your first turn? Alright, number 9 is an interesting problem. And, and sometimes it's, it's helpful to rearrange the problem in your head and put it in a little bit different context. 37% of the time, you're going to end up with this... Uh, price so it was the it was the paddle and then you have the life jacket 14% of the time and the sunscreen was 8% of the time well picture this you're only you're only taking one turn okay you're only going to uh, imagine this as drawing a card you're only gonna draw one card um, so we wanna look at the probability of of not getting any of these things on our first turn. So if you if you think about it as almost if there were a hundred cards if there are a hundred cards how many of them would be um, the paddle card? How many of them would be the uh, life jacket card? And how many of them would be the sunscreen card? Well all of the the prize cards, your paddle, your life jacket, your sunscreen, um, the number of cards out of that 100 is going to be uh, 59. These total up, if you add these, you're going to get 0.59. So 59 out of the 100 cards are either going to give you a paddle, uh, 
a life jacket or sunscreen well that leaves you with 41 cards we don't get any prize 49 out of the 100 so the probability of not getting any of those things on your first turn is going to be 0.41 so you have a 41 percent chance of none of those things happening and, and you can think about it as well the probability of getting a paddle or getting a life jacket or getting sunscreen is 0.59 so the probability of of one of those things happening was 0.59 the probability of none of those things happening was uh, was 0.41 one thing I've seen students try to do on a problem like this is set this up okay this isn't correct but let's talk about it they said well why don't I just look at the probability of uh, these three things not happening because if I get a paddle 37% of the time, then that means that 63% uh, of the time, I'm not going to get it. As far as the life jacket goes, if I get it 14% of the time, that means 86% of the time, I'm not going to get it. And the sunscreen, if I get it 8% of the time, that means that 92% of the time, I'm not going to get it. And I've stu seen students multiply these three probabilities together. Well that answers a question just not our question when you think multiplication think of this as uh, things happening in succession so what I have for you right here is three things happening in a row so this would effectively calculate the probability that on your first draw you do not get the paddle and on the second draw you do not get the life jacket and on a third draw you do not get the sunscreen so this is you know, think about this as three things are going to happen in a row. We've said you don't get the paddle on your first draw. I didn't say what you did get or if you did get anything. I simply said no on the paddle. Then I said no on the sunscreen. And then I said no on the, uh, sorry, no on the life jacket for the second and no on the sunscreen for the last one. That doesn't mean that you had three turns and didn't come out with the paddle, uh, life jacket, or sunscreen. That just means that those three things didn't happen in that order. Okay, problem 10. We have 26 students. Um, 14 girls. Which is going to leave us with 12 boys. Of the 12 boys, 0 with braces. Of the 14 girls, there are 3 with braces. Alright, so it says use probability notation to determine if having braces and being a girl are independent or dependent. So our events are uh, braces and girl so let's look at just the probability that somebody has braces well of the 26 students three of them have braces now if we look at the probability of having braces given that you're a girl well how many girls do we have 14 right because we're only looking at the girls it says we've selected a girl now what's the probability that she has braces well that's going to be 3 out of 14 if you compare these probabilities you'll notice they're not the same so not the same dependent events so think about it um, you know, this data would say, hey, being a girl increases the likelihood that you have braces, but this is only for one class. Um, so for this class, you're going to say uh, being a girl and having braces are, are dependent uh, events. Okay, 11. 
Suppose each student in a group of 100 drew Skittle candies, one at a time out of individual bags, until he or she got a green one. The trial is taking a candy out of the bag. Each student uh, counted the number of trials until a green candy was drawn. The frequency distribution is seen, so you have that paper. Um, and the frequency distribution shows us uh, kind of a record of how many draws it took to get the first green candy. So I go all the way down to the 13. Well, only one student required 13 draws to get their first green candy. Uh, it says make a histogram of the results of the frequency table and describe its basic shape. So that's for A. So you're going to have frequency on the traditional y-axis. And on the x-axis, we're going to have number of draws. Uh, we need to go all the way up to 13. 1, 4, 5, 6, 7. And we can start to fill this in. Uh, the most common, most common occurrence was the getting a green on the first draw. So our y-axis needs to go all the way up to 22. So I can call this uh, 5, 10, 15, 20. So 22 will be just higher than that. Uh, as far as a title on this number of draws, taken to get a green all right so the number of draws taken to get a green uh, getting it on your first draw happened 22 times so we'll put this up with the 22 uh, two draws taken was 18 All right, so here's the frequency table, and we're going to go ahead and say this thing is skewed to the right. All right it's skewed to the right. Uh, use your histogram to estimate the average waiting time for drawing a green candy. This is kind of that, that balancing point uh, question. So if you think about each of the bars that you see here as carrying a, a specific weight. Right? So the taller the bar, the heavier it is. So if you wanted to balance this and and find a find a point where this thing was going to balance, let's say uh, if you put the point right here, this side over here is obviously much heavier than this side over here, because right? if you add up the heights of all these bars, it's a lot taller than the heights of these bars over here. So that's obviously not the balancing point. So you just want to try to give it a good estimation. Um, and it's probably, as I look at this, that balancing point, maybe in, in this region here. So, you know, you could safely say probably between three and five draws is the average. Uh, part C. Part C, use the frequency table to calculate the average waiting time for drawing a green candy. We had a hundred trials. And we're looking for the average number of draws per trial. So you need to know the total number of draws. Right? So the total number of actual uh, candy seen, total number of draws. So if you take a second and and go across and multiply all of the frequencies by the uh, events. So I have 1 times 22, 2 times 18, 3 times 15, 4 times 13, and go down the list and add all those up. You're going to you're gonna get a handle on the total number of draws. So I'm going to do that real quick. So I totaled it up and I came up with 369 draws. So total number 
of draws. So when we divide the two, we're going to get number of draws per, on the bottom we have trials, so per one trial. So we'll move the decimal place twice on the top, we'll get 3.69 draws per trial. So on average it took 3.69 draws to uh, pull out a green candy. Uh, D says is drawing eight candies to get the first green candy a rare event. And how do you know? Well this whole rare event they say in the upper five percent. So let's look at um, drawing eight candies. Did that happen less than five percent of the time? Well it only happened three out of the 100 trials. So yes, I would say drawing a a green candy uh, in eight draws is a rare event. So three out of 100. So three represents the number of times it took exactly eight draws. And if we divide those two, we get 0 0.03 or 3%. So 3% is less than 5%, because that's kind of that, that point where we say hey, rare events are going to happen less than 5% of the time. So we would say, yes, that is a, that is a rare event. The whole 5% might seem kind of arbitrary, but if I simply would have said, is it a rare event, and you didn't, if I would have said, is it a rare event, and you didn't know anything about, well, what does rare mean, uh, we wouldn't be able to say yes or no. It would just be a judgment call for every individual. But when I say, hey, rare event means less than 5% of the time, then we're all going to answer the question the same way. All right, two more to go, 12 and 13. 12. Scott is at a carnival, wants to play a game. He must pay $1 to roll a die. If he gets a 1 or a 2 or a 3 on a die, then he will receive $0. So 1, 2, 3, all receive $0. Uh, if he gets a 4 on the die, then he will receive $2. Uh, and if he gets a five or a six, then he will receive one dollar. Is this a fair game? So the cost is one dollar. So I want you to think about if I wanted to turn, if I wanted each number to turn up once, theoretically, how many times would I play? Well, I'd play six times because there are six numbers that are equally likely. So cost to play six times is six dollars. In theory, if I play six times, I will win. So this is what we have to determine. So if we determine that it's six dollars, then great. This is a fair game, right? Because what it cost you is is what you ended up making. Uh, you broke even, so it's not a profitable game, but it would be a fair game. So think about the four is going to show up once. So hey, you win two dollars one time. Uh, in those six times, the five and the six each show up once. So you, you win a dollar on each of those. The one, two, and three all show up once. You've completed the, the six rolls now. And you have only run one, four dollars. So it cost you six, and you earned four. So this game is not fair. This is not a fair game. And that's because, um, if you think about it, if it costs you a dollar to play, on average, how much are you going to win um, per time you play? Well, if you win $4 every six, 
take 4 and divide it by 6, and you get 2 thirds. So you win roughly 66 cents uh, per time you play. So it costs a dollar, and on average you win 66 cents. Um, that's not a fair game. Uh, 13. So I'm going to add this here to 12. Uh, if we go 4 divided by 6, and remember 4 is the uh, winnings after 6. Now we'll just put 4 divided by 6 is 2 thirds. So we're looking at roughly 0 0.67 dollars or 67 cents. Okay, 13. So Brianna is creating a fair game for a carnival. What value should she place in the spinner below to make this a fair game? So we'll break it up. First off, you have to decide on a cost to play. I'm going to go ahead and set mine at uh, $5. Okay. Now, another thing I'm going to look at is all of the regions that you can land on. So I've got one region here. That's uh, the probability of this region is one half. This is a fourth. These two together make up a fourth, so each of them are an eight. So if you're going to spin this wheel, how many times would you have to spin it to ensure that you landed in each region once? Well, I'm going to tell you, I think it takes eight spins to land in each region at least once. Okay. So go in a different color color. So if you spin eight times, how many times are you gonna land in the one half region? If the probability of it happening is one half, that's gonna happen. How many of those eight times? Four. A quarter of the time, a quarter of those eight spins you'll be here. What's a quarter of eight? Two. One out of eight, you'll be here. So that happens once, and this happens once. So four spins were here, two spins were here, one spin were here, and one spin were in this region. All right, well, if the cost to play is $5, um, we can say that eight spins is going to cost how much? $40. So we want to make sure that after our eight spins, we've also earned forty dollars. Okay, so go back to what I have highlighted in yellow and think this region here, whatever that prize is, you're going to get that four times. Okay, so I'm going to go four. Let's say it's I go with two dollars. So four times out of those eight, you're going to win two dollars. And let's say this prize here. Well, that's going to happen twice out of the eight. So twice out of the eight, let's say it's um, $5. So you're just breaking even on those. So let's see what do we have. Okay, that would be $8. That would be $10. Okay. We have the other two regions left. Right now we're only up to $18. And we need to get to 40. Okay, well, one time out of the eight, you're going to land here in this region. Well, let's say for that one time, on average, one out of eight, let's say on that one time you earn uh, $12. Okay, so we're up to $12 there on that. So if we add those up, Right now we're at thirty dollars. Thirty dollars. So the last region that we're looking at, 
to assign a prize to, that's only going to happen on one out of the eight spins. So if we're, we're at $30 and we need to get to 40 and this is only going to occur once, well, it better be a $10 prize. So the way I approached this problem was, I said, let's pick a cost to play. And then let's look at the probability of landing in each region. And once we did that, then we went to this number 8. Because you used your probabilities to say, OK, how many times would I have to play to ensure that I landed in each region once? And you said 8. And we said 8. Because the, uh, the least frequent things that are going to happen are the 1 8 I said, OK, the cost is 5 bucks, and we've got to play 8 times to land everywhere, at least once. So that's $40. And then we said, OK, well, if we play 8 times and it costs us $40, let's make sure that after 8 times we've won $40. And we knew that, OK, half the time, half the time we're going to be in this upper region. So on 4 out of those 8 spins, we'll be up here. So let's assign a prize amount up here. And I said, hey, let's pick two dollars. Okay, so four spins, you win two dollars. You've won, you've won eight dollars, and that's where this eight came from. Now you got four spins left, and you know, two of them are going to land in this region here. So pick a prize value, and I said five dollars. So you land there twice, five dollars a piece. Yeah, that's another ten dollars. So we've taken care of six spins, four that landed in the one half region, two that landed in the one fourth. And we had one each left to distribute to the one eighth regions. Um, so we were at a total of eighteen dollars, and I knew that in my last two spins, I needed to get twenty-two dollars more. So I assigned one of them a twelve-dollar prize and one of them a ten-dollar prize. And now we have created a fair game.